not going to be near as effective as if we have the power of the Holy Ghost going with us. Because the more we draw closer to God, the deeper our relationship with Him, the deeper the anointing we have as we go. And it is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. And that's exactly what we are dealing with with sin. It is the yoke of bondage. People are bound by their sin. They are bound by a, a pornography. They are bound by drugs. They are bound by alcohol. They are bound by lying. And the only way those chains are going to get broken free is through the power of the Holy Ghost. But we need to prepare ourselves to make sure that we are able to bring the true gospel message to them and bring deliverance through them to the power through the power of the Holy Ghost. He is the one that sets the captives free. Yes, he is. And to those who are willing to hear the salvation message, it brings peace. And it is a peace like this world has never known before. To the sinner, they may have thought that they have known peace in the past or experienced peace. But when it comes to the peace of God, it is like nothing else that it can be compared to. It is a peace that brings freedom from stress, worry, hell, the wrath of God, and etc. The gospel message reassures the believer of the security that exists inside Jesus Christ and reinstills within the believer a peace that surpasses all understanding. What does Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7 state? Philippians 4 7. Give me one moment. I didn't have this in my notes, so I'm cheating. Beautiful RFP. And so I was doing the search for so I'm cheating. Beautiful are the feet, scripture verse, page 80. But it is a peace that assures them of the right standing with God. What does Isaiah 52 and verse 7 say? Isaiah 52, 7. of the gospel of peace. It is a peace, it is a message that every believer ought to preach everywhere. It is a message that they ought to tell to everyone who will listen. And it is a message that brings peace to all who receive it. It is a message that needs not be preached necessarily through words or just words, but also actions. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2 say? 2 Corinthians 3, 2. Second Corinthians 3, 2. Ye are an epistle written on our hearts, known of all men. Epistle written on our hearts, known of all men. What is that referring to? It's referring to the believer as being an epistle, a book of the Bible, a chapter of the Bible, that are known and read of men. You know, some people will never pick up a Bible and read it for themselves. Some men and women will never know God for themselves. 
But you realize we are living in a day and age where we can see the great falling away in the church. Yeah. We can see the heresy in the church where people are preaching to those having itching ears. They are preaching that it's all right to go out and um, sin as long as you come into the church and ask for forgiveness on Sunday. You can go out and drink your alcohol. You can go out and have your booze. You can go out and have your drugs as long as you come on Sunday and ask for forgiveness. You can go out and live whatever way you want. There are preachers that will never preach on sin, that will never preach on um, hell. Why? Because it leaves negative connotations. That is not the true gospel message of Jesus Christ. When you preach the true gospel message of Jesus Christ, people are going to be looking at your life to see if you're living it. Because if you're not living it, then it must not be true. And though men and women may never pick up the Bible, if you tell them what the Word of God says, and you live it, and you're unpersuaded in your journey, and you can't be moved to the left, to the right, they're going to take notice to it. And they're going to take notice that there's something different. And that in itself, our lives can be the gospel message to them. Yes, we need to tell them verbally, but they need to see that we're living it as well. Because if we do not live according to the Word of God, then they're going to think that their sin can be justified. That they can do whatever they want. If so-and-so can do this, then why can't I do that? And we've even heard that probably within the church. Well, if she can do that, well, why can't I can do that? Or if he can do that, why is it all right for him? Why can't I do that? Or wear this or wear that, whatever it is. But it's up to us and our relationship with God. To show the world that what we speak is the truth. And because it is the truth, we live it with every ounce of our being. The strongest sermon that anyone can preach is not with enticing words of men, but rather is the testimony of the believer through their everyday actions. Because it shows that we know what is truth and we're doing everything we can to make it to heaven. The believer must know that they are first a child of God, and then we'll receive peace. But this peace sometimes departs from the believer. And the believer must be reminded of whom they serve. Because he is the Prince of Peace. Why? Because there are sometimes when we go through things in our life that are not always peaceful. They're not always the calmest of situations. They bring turmoil to our world. They really do. They turn it upside down. And it's in those times when the devil would love to make our faith shakable that we would turn from God. But when we realize and we find ourselves in those situations and we find ourselves in a place of prayer, of true prayer, God will remind us that he is the Prince of Peace. And it doesn't matter what the devil or this world throws at us. He is with us throughout every single battle throughout every single trial. The disciples were on the Sea of Galilee, if I remember correctly. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. And he was in the very, very, very bottom. Out of sight, out of mind. But a great storm came. And it began tossing the boat to and fro. And the winds blew. I'm assuming the thunder clashed. The rain drops down for, and they were in the time of their life. They were going through something that brought fear to them, something that brought possibly calamity in the future. It was something that shook them, and these were fishermen who had been on the sea before. But when Jesus came up from the bottom of the boat, what did he speak to the wind? What did he speak to the storm? Peace be still. Peace be still. And everything stopped. You know, there are times when we're going to face storms in our life that rocks the boat. And the rain's pounding, and the storm's clanging, the thunder's clashing, and the lightning might seem like it's striking very closely. And our peace is gone. But when we get our eyes back on Christ, we can experience peace like we've never experienced before. Once again, disciples are on the Sea of Galilee. They're coming back from the land of the Gadarenes. Legion has just been cast into swine. 
Jesus is off on a mountain praying. And a storm arises. And they see something that appears like a ghost in the distance, walking on the water. And Peter got out of the boat because Jesus said in his eye, come unto me. Did Peter know fear at that moment when he stepped down the boat? No. He was fine. He was going to Christ. But when did he experience fear? When he got his eyes off of Christ. As long as our eyes are on Christ, it doesn't matter what we go through. Doesn't mean that we won't have pain. It won't mean that we won't have discomfort. But we can experience a peace like this world has never known. Because our eyes are locked on Christ. Not the situation. But they are locked on Christ. The Prince of Peace. And when our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we keep our eyes on Christ. When battles arise. We will still know peace. Because we know the one who is peace. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Stated that Jesus is not just the one upon whom the shoulders of the governments were placed, but he's the prince of peace. He is the anointed one. When trials and battles come, we need to remember that he is peace. And we need to have our eyes fixed on him. And Christ resides as the one whom believers can trust in any situation, in any circumstance, on any occasion, we can trust in Him fully because He is going to the Father on our behalf. What does Romans chapter 8, verse 34 state? Romans 8, 34. 8, 34. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. 
We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, make himself visible if you so choose us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, give them the songs you'd have us to sing, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, anoint the pastor as he brings forth your message today. Anoint his mind as he looks to bring forth the words you'd have us to hear. Anoint our minds and our hearts to receive your message today. That we may remember throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. That we may be transformed into your very image even farther. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Am